Mike helped me with the little map, but here's what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to try and recap where we are uh, in 10 seconds or less. So you ready? You can, uh, you know, try and time me on your watch. I may make it, I may not. But here it is, trying to uh, do a summary in 10 seconds or less. Solomon, son of David, became king. He ushered in the golden age of Israel, but he used his heavy taxes and forced labor. His labor boss, Jeroboam, got ticked off at Solomon because the king favored the south, and he was a northern guy. So Jeroboam says to Egypt, but a prophet tells him, one day you will rule in order. Meanwhile, back in Israel, Solomon passes the crown to his son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam is a spoiled rat with the political savvy of a cockroach. For his first official act, the people ask him to lighten the heavy taxes of his father, but Rehoboam makes them even heavier so the people revolt. Meanwhile, Jeroboam comes back from Egypt to take up the people's cause. The north forms its own nation, and Israel is broken into Judah to the south and Israel to the north. Rehoboam is the son of king in Jerusalem, Jeroboam is in the north. Judah is one of the only tribes with a sprinkling of Benjamites, and Israel is uh, the other ten tribes, and that's the story so far. Got it? <laughs> Taking notes? Okay. That's, that's kind of where we are, and we start with the lower story. You know, we've been talking lower story, upper story. And basically the whole idea of lower story is the day-to-day -day that we go through. This is what we see. This is what we, we only know what's coming uh, in the next second. We only know where we are right now. Ground level, right? Ground level. Of course, the upper story is the big picture, the eternal picture of what God's doing. Now, as we first look at what was talked about here, concentrating on this thing with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, you might, if I were to ask you, what's the story? As I did myself, as I look, looked at it, you might say, well, the story is kind of a good leader, bad leader thing going on here, or a villain and hero. And uh, Rehoboam playing the heavy, he's, he's the, the one laying down these big taxes. And maybe we see Jeroboam as a hero, and that even his name means struggler for the people. And, and even scripture spoke, spoke um, uh, highly of him, at least at first, uh, he was called a man of valor, and he was, uh, Solomon said he was an industrious man, so he sure sounds like a hero. But the truth is, there really are no heroes in this story, at least not from the human side. There's really no heroes. Both kings, north and south, turned their back on God. The kingdom right now is broken in two. And, and Bob uh, said it very nicely from, uh, in his reading. He said that the uh, Civil War went on for 200 years and they never did reunite. It was broken and nobody was going to put it back together. Sounds pretty discouraging, doesn't it? And on top of that, the two portions, the two different countries now were being led by men who were leading them astray. So they were systematically deconstructing the law that God put out. So think of yourself. Try and take yourself and place yourself into the lower story. Try and see yourself living at that time. What would you feel if you were a really a, a, a God follower? You would probably feel like things were really falling apart. That God made these plans and, and here they are falling apart. And you just wonder where it's all going. But, but, if we switch our focus upward, if we start looking at the big picture, at the upper story, we find that actually as you read through Kings, it's not a story of God's plan falling apart at all. It's a story of how God's plan can never fall apart. It's a story that God's word, what he says, cannot be twisted and it cannot be resisted. What God says happens. And there is, in a nutshell, what Kings tells us. What God says happens. Now, it may look like it's not going to. Situation at the time, uh, the people you're dealing with at the time, it may look like there's no way. But what God says happens. A little trip down memory lane so far is what we look at. Where did God say some things and lay down some promises or warnings? Well, let's start with this one, the promise to Abraham. He, he took this old man and this very old woman and told them they would be the source, the root of a nation, that there'd be so many people, uh, it'd be like the stars in the heavens. 
And it sounds crazy, except it happened. Just as God said. The promise to Moses. Same thing. The superpower of the time, Egypt said, you're not leaving. What Egypt says goes. But God said, yeah, the Hebrew people would get to leave. And God told them, he said, if you, this big band of ex-slaves, this ragtag group, if you will follow my law, you will take this promised land. Promised long ago to Abraham. If you don't follow the law, you won't be able to take it. And that's exactly how it happened. When the people didn't listen, they wandered in the desert. When they started listening, they took the land. Exactly as God had said. And then there was the uh, warning against earthly kings. Remember that one? It, it wasn't that... Uh, far in the past, remember the first king whose name was of, of um, Israel. So, thank, thank you, Ron. I thought nobody's going to win a cup of coffee there. They were all going to make a quiet. Yeah. Oh, you saw it in the book. Well, even if you cheat, it's a lot. <laughs> Can't cheat if you're looking in, in the book. But as Ron rightly said, when before Saul became king, do you remember God gave a warning? And it basically went like this. I was your king. Now you want an earthly king. And I'm going to warn you on this. You take an earthly king, you're going to have to pay a whole load of money to him that you don't want to be paying. And then that king's going to take all your taxes and your money and go into projects and build things and stuff that you don't want to be bothered building, but he's going to make you. And he's going to call you a war and different things like this. Where we are right now in the time of Solomon, isn't it interesting? Solomon brought in the uh, golden age of Israel, but he did it on the back of heavy, heavy taxes and on forced labor. And, and to the point where that's where Jeroboam comes in. That's why he, uh, he was playing favorites with uh, projects in the south. And Jeroboam, uh, the son of a widow in the north, he knew it wasn't fair, and he, he really kind of revolted against this. And the people in the time of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in his time, they gave a chance. They came to him and said, hey, lighten the taxes and we'll be okay. He says, no, I'm making them heavier. So they are revolting for the very thing God warned them three generations before would happen. What God says happens. And then there was the promise to David. Remember David. God told him because he followed him with all his heart, made a few mistakes along the way, but followed him with all his heart, that his throne would go on forever. His throne would go on forever. Now imagine if you're in this time. We're only uh, three generations down the road from David, and already the kingdom is broken in two. Already the throne is in, at risk. Already there are ten of the twelve tribes that are going their own way, and really only one. There's a sprinkling of Benjamites, and there really only one, Judah, that was by itself. And, and it looked like if we were betting people, and we lived back then, we would put down the odds that Judah's not going to survive. Who are you going to bet on? The ten that are to the north. But the truth is, we have the advantage of seeing far into the future from there. And within 900 years, we find out that the, the people that did survive were the remnant of Judah. And through the line of David, just as promised, came the Messiah, who is the King of Kings, rules forever and ever. It just looked like it wasn't even a possibility, and it happens, just as God says. Just as God says. And if that's not enough proof, here we are 2,000 years after that time, and you are sitting there, and I am speaking, and we're, you're listening, and we're all reflecting on this, because all the stuff that really shouldn't have happened at all happened because God said it. You are sitting here because God said it would. It happens as God says. It is very hard to read through uh, Kings and Chronicles, read through these books and not come away and go, wow, things happen the way God says. It happens the way God says. And when God promises something, it happens. When God says something, 
It happens. That's the way it works. When God says it, it happens. But that's really only the first level of the truth we're looking at. The story goes even deeper. And this is where we get into that part now. Some of you out there look pretty intelligent, so maybe you grasp this more than I did, but it, it turns out a paradox, really, to me, but something worth knowing. Building on that fact that what God says happens. And let me back up and kind of come into it. It's uh, uh, starting with prophecies that were made against some of the wayward kings. Here we know that Solomon was not a good boy. That's the theological way, if, if you want to put it, to say, what was Solomon? He wasn't a good boy. Sounds work for you, Mike? Okay. Solomon drifted at the end of his life, and he was going to pay a price for it. In 1 Kings 11.30, then um, Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it in 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, now this is when Jeroboam had enough of what Solomon was doing. He was getting ready to leave the country. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David. In other words, promise. And for the sake of Jerusalem, the city, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Asherah, the goddess of the Sidians, and Hemus, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my stat statutes and my judgments as their father David did. In other words, they were paying the price for what they did. The consequences we see, the kingdom broken too, all kinds of division. But here God brings this other fellow named Jeroboam to lead the north tribes. Four total, right? The thing is, is God also knew that this Jeroboam was going to be even more wicked than Solomon. He was going to do some bad falling away. And judgments were going to come down on him too. 1 Kings 14. Moreover, this is talking to Jeroboam. Now after he has ruled and led everybody astray in the north, the Lord will rise up for himself, a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day. What? Even now. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the river because they have made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. If we were able to be there and look into the future, you know what we'd say? is that's exactly what happens. Within a generation, Jeroboam's whole family line gets slaughtered because uh, another king takes over. And in time, all of Israel, all that northern uh, kingdom gets taken over the river. There's one to throw out. Which river do you think we're talking about? Jordan. Yes, that's it. The Jordan River, which was the symbol they came into the Promised Land, it's a symbol they were taken out. They were taken across the Jordan into Assyria, never to be seen again. So things happen just as God says. Point being this, what God says happens, we found that out, despite what people may do. It was a king that had all the power of royalty, could tell people what to do, was systematically taking the religion apart, and yet God's plan doesn't change one iota. It isn't altered one little bit. It happens just the way God said it would before time ever began, despite what the king did, despite what people do. What God says happens despite what people may do. But you know what? That's still not getting to the real mind blower. The real mind blower kind of comes down to this. Even as people rebel against God's will, God is using them to carry it out. Even as people are rebelling against God's will, He's using them to carry it out. How does that happen? Because they are still allowed free choice. And they still pay for the destructive consequences of, of what they're doing. And their sins still affect other people. 
And all of this is going on, but God's ordained work still doesn't change. Even despite their free will in doing wrong, God's still using them to carry out His will. Doesn't change His plan at all. Trying to change God's plan is kind of like in the summertime, go down to the lake with a shovel and try and dig a hole in the water. That's what it's like to try and change God's plan. It, it just fills in and it's the same no matter what you do. You cannot change it. And that's what happened in Jeroboam being a, 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 a perfect example of this. Things went on except they went on without Jeroboam. God's plan played out except without Jeroboam's line. And that's where the message starts getting down to us. This very, very difficult message. This very hard thing to get your mind around. What God says happens. And God does it to people. What God says happens and God does it to people. It's just the case of God's good stuff. Things like eternal life. And things like reward and fulfillment. God's good stuff will happen. But it will happen with or without you. It will happen. It will happen with or without you. Somehow, somehow, God has a predestined plan that nothing can take and make not happen. And yet you still have personal choice in that plan. Personal choice and predestination. All in the same thing. Laid out and yet you still have a choice. It's mind-boggling. And in the same way, what God says will happen, but God does it through people. He does it through people. So all the good stuff that God does in the works that goes on in the world, in lives, those good things will happen. But they will happen because of you or despite you. They will happen because of you or despite you. God's plan is going to carry out. It's just which side of the plan you fall on. Which side do you choose? The good side, the bad side. So do you see why I'm asking those questions? Are you a with person? Or are you a without person? Are you a because person? Or are you a despite person? Which way do you fall on? Each one of us, every day, we consciously choose what we do.